Hey, what's up guys? It's Wilson and Elson here again. We've had awesome operators so far in Fish Sauce, but today, Kyle Louie, who's on the other side of the table, will share his experience as an investor. Kyle is a principal at DCM Ventures, which is a venture capital firm with over $3 billion under management across U.S. and Asia. Kyle was introduced to us by one of Wilson and I's very good friend, David Chang, who's also at DCM Ventures. Let's see what Kyle's secret sauce is. You've done a lot for such a young age. In your own words, how do you describe your experience? So I actually started college pretty early. So I started college when I was 16 and graduated when I was 19. So I had a lot more time. And so when I graduated, I didn't feel the pressure to have everything figured out. So I actually started my career in consulting, but I only did that for like six months. And then after six months, I went backpacking around Europe. A lot of my peers were still in college and it was a time for me to just do some reflection. And when I came back to the U.S. in 2004, the market has picked up you know, materially. All the banks were starting to hire again and thinking about you know, going to investment banking. And then this opportunity as a you know, PE analyst came about and I did that for two years and then was deciding between a few different opportunities. I had studied abroad in Hong Kong. So I, I spent a few months down in Hong Kong, actually during SARS. And I knew that I, you know, I wanted to spend a few years in Asia working just because I, I hadn't had a lot of exposure to Asia growing up. My family never really like traveled and, uh, you know, we, we basically just like stayed in L.A. And so I, I wanted to broaden my experiences and spend a few years in Asia. It was really with the financial crisis that I decided, okay, I'm go back to business school, have some time to, to figure out what I wanted to do. And it was very easy to think like, okay, well, I'm just going to go back into, into finance. You know, I, I sort of what I know and I sort of made the hard decision to say I'm going to basically start over and do something completely different and there's nothing more like different than starting a company and really learned a lot in that time and and in terms of you know being kind of like a tech product manager and and, and, and gaining experience as like an operating executive i actually think i i learned more at salesforce than i did as an entrepreneur it was a different skill set like how does like the most successful SaaS company think about go to market and serving customers and product management and software development I felt like I grew up a lot during that time, and then venture was kind of a natural progression of a lot of things that I've done in the past. And I really enjoy working with you know young entrepreneurs. I like being able to you know provide my perspective, listen to them, learn from them as well. And so it's a pretty collaborative, longer term process. I think one of the takeaways from what you just said is kind of staying in consulting for only six months and then going to travel. That shows that you have a pretty high risk appetite. What would you say about that? Because I think a lot of people stay in jobs longer than they expect to try to get those two years of experience so they have kind of their full built-out story. I have two things to say there. One, you're trained from like a very early age to, to follow, follow the rules and kind of like work the system to get ahead, you know, primarily academically. So it's like you're taught that at a very early age, you excel academically, get into the best college, and then, you know, find the best job. It's, it's different for different people, right? Like there's some families where they push them to say you have to be a doctor or someone that pushed them to say you have to find like a really stable job and others that kind of provide more freedom, but like, you know, I'd really want you to at least major in engineering or something like that, right? And so you you sort of follow this path and it, when you have that family background, it could be hard to say, hey, I'm going to step out of that and do something really risky. What was your family background? So my family, I think, was was actually pretty, I mean, you know, very tr traditional Asian family in that they pushed you really hard and things like that. But there wasn't like a like an explicit, like, you have to be a doctor, you have to be a, a lawyer, you have to, you know, do this this or that. So from, from that perspective, it was pretty good. And then also just for me, in my personality, I wouldn't listen to my parents anyway, so <laughs> they sort of like realized that and like, okay, just do, just do what you want. But I think that when you're, when you're kind of trained in that way, it can be hard to, to, to step out. One of the things that I've seen change, especially in the last you know, 10, 20 years, is that you're starting to see more Asian Americans just do that. And as you, as you see your peers start to do that, you start to say, hey, well, you know, I'm seeing so-and-so start a company. I'm seeing so-and-so, who's a good friend of mine that I've known for a long time, like mm -hmm. leave his job after six months and just try something completely different. You know, I still remember like when we were in college, everybody was just focused on like, how do I get the best job with the best consulting firm or the best investment bank? And it was like, no one really thought about starting companies. And now that's really changed a lot. You know, a lot of the, the college students that I talk to, you know, they're exploring all different avenues. And I, I think that, that that openness is really good. 
Would you say from your experience, yourself and your friends thinking about starting a company, or did you see other people at that time starting companies and made you thought it, it is okay? Yeah, to do so, so so that so it was absolutely I can have to attribute it to HBS. Like I, I don't think that I would have started a company right out of finance. It was really being at HBS and being around a lot of folks that have worked in tech, a lot of my best friends there that were start they were all starting companies. They were not recruiting at all. There was no interest in trying to find any kind of corporate job, and they, they were just focused on either finding a, a, a role as like you know employee number three at a company or starting a company. And so when you're around that, you're like, okay, well, why why can't I do it? All these folks are doing it, and they're good friends of mine. That was actually a bigger motivator than than you would think. Quick hypothetical question: What if you didn't go to business school? I mean, I don't know. I think that if I was Living in Hong Kong, the likelihood I would have started a company there was like close to zero. There was no infrastructure support system for technology startups. But if I knew at the time that I was going to move back to San Francisco, I think I probably would have at some point considered starting a company. I have a bunch of friends that worked at what are now like pretty big startups, but they were like early employees. And so if I joined one of those, I could see myself leaving after a few years and starting a company. That's also a pretty common route. A question about being Asian American. Do you feel like it's provided you any advantages when you were starting your own venture or potentially any disadvantages? There's definitely clear advantages if you know how to leverage them correctly. In terms of disadvantages, I'm, I'm sure there probably are in my personal experience. I, I, I haven't really experienced it. So I, I, can, give you, I can give you a couple tangible examples. Um, when you're raising capital, for example, it's, it's all about your network and your hustle and being able to find the folks that really back you. And at the early stages, it's really hard to, very rare where there are these ideas that just completely jump out or the traction is, is just through the roof. Like most of the time, it's, it's a gray area. Investors are backing the, the person, the co-founding team. And so going into networks where there's some sort of affinity is really helpful. I have seen that with like Asian Americans and some of my angel investors were were Asian, right? On the on the disadvantage side, I think that when you are pitching, you know, non-Asian American investors, particularly white investors, they may have certain stereotypes in, in their head in terms of like, is this person aggressive enough or driven enough or is this person going to be able to recruit a team they just have these stereotypes which i personally think is quickly going away it was much more common 10 years ago 20 years ago most of the the kind of like east asian talent in the valley tended to be highly technical individual contributor engineers right and not necessarily in management roles and as you saw that start to change you start started to see some of the, the stereotypes start start to change but you know, the, the reality is that if you look at venture in terms of a group, like it's definitely not the most diverse group. It's it's still the majority male. It's still majority white, although that part is changing. And, and at least we're having a conversation about diversity. I think that, that the key there is just to understand who your audience is. And so you address those potential concerns, whether they're explicit or implicit, head on. It's what I advise entrepreneurs to do like in their pitch as well. Like, think about what the objections are and, and try to address them you know, either head on or, or very subtly. I think you could attribute that to the same for maybe Asian Americans in some larger companies as well because I think oftentimes we actually don't see many Asian Americans being in executive roles or kind of C-suite roles and, and that might be attributed through some stereotypes where they might not be good managers because they're not good at decision making their gut decisions aren't aggressive enough in some sense, or they might not have the presence that some board, board members like. Would you say that, that potentially is the case? Having worked at large companies, small companies, started a company and having raised funding and now being on, on the capital side, I would say in all of the places, it, probably corporate America is where it is most challenging, I think, even more so than finance. And I think the reason it's more so than finance is because when you work, for example, like for a hedge fund or a P firm or a venture fund, a lot of it is, at least over time, like based on actual numbers, like how are you doing, right? So you have objective performances. But in corporate, so much of it is relationship-based, right? And there's 
just like basic kind of behavioral science around how people make decisions and there are actual like psychological biases that people have that they just don't know, like things like, you know, the similar to me effect, halo effect, things like if someone is good at X, they must also be good at X, Y, and Z. And so, you know, th those are things that I think folks need to be need to be aware of. Again, I think that's changing. You start to see more executives of different diversities and you're starting to see Asian Americans in, in, in C-suite. But there's a reason why there's, you know, affinity groups at a lot of the big corporate. I think one other thing, this is very specific to Asian Americans, is when you're in particularly large, say, like technology focused corporates, there's a distinction and a clear distinction between Asian Americans, so those that grew up in, in the US, and then like Asians that immigrated over here from China or Korea or whatever, like very culturally different. And oftentimes for folks that are not Asian, like it's grouped in the same group, right? And so that's something you have to consider as well, where like, for, for example, like growing up, like again, I said, like we never, like even though I'm, I'm like Chinese American, like we never went to China, right? Like people didn't, it's not common for folks that are like in their 30s, who were born in the US to have like gone to China because it was largely closed then. The idea of not having an affinity to a country where you're like, you're that ethnicity is very strange for people that are, that are, you know, just like, Caucasian, right? Just understanding that distinction can actually go a long way in, in, in helping you decide like who you want to cultivate relationships with. I think specifically in the corporate sense, it's important to have a diverse set of mentors and champions. Yeah, yeah not just say, okay, I'm going to find the most senior, you know, Asian American male and have them like mentor you because you do have, you recognize that other folks may can see through that and say, okay, well, you're cha like they might unfairly say you're trying to champion this other person because they're similar to you, right? And so it's actually important to go and find folks of different backgrounds and, and getting them to also champion you. You did mention that within Asians, there's Asian Americans and Asians from Asia. Yeah. Um, are there specific advice you would give for those two different groups? I think that, and, and I think I have a unique perspective in that I've actually lived in Asia and that you know, DCM as a firm is probably the most active Silicon Valley based firm in, in Asia and everybody that we hire in in China is like native, you know, Chinese and everyone from Japan is native native Japan, even though everyone's fluent in English. And I'd say that for the folks who move over from Asia and they're trying to work and this could be like either in a corporate setting or in a you know entrepreneurial setting, I think they need to work much harder in understanding the American culture and what Americans value and not try to prescribe to say, okay, well, I'm just going to, like, this is how they do it in China or this is how they do it in Korea, so I'm just going to, you know, pursue it that way. And I think it's particularly important in two areas. One is if you're trying to move up in, a, in, a, in an American company, understanding, like, how to make sure that you're properly recognize for the work that you do because a lot of times it's like okay i'm just gonna sit heads down and just like work really hard and somebody will recognize that yeah. but like you know somebody that your peer might be going out of their way to cultivate those relationships is very much an american thing so understanding like how folks move ahead in, in the u.s is important and then as a entrepreneur or potential entrepreneur like raising capital finding both like those that really resonate with your story and that could be like maybe now there's like tons of international capital coming to the U.S. and taking full advantage of that. And then if there are major issues with like accents and things like that, like really practicing on that is, is going to be really important because if you can't understand what you're saying, it's going to be hard to, to, to get your message across. And then specifically for like Asian Americans, there's a natural inclination to when some, sometimes when things don't work out your way to attribute it to the fact that you're Asian American. I've done this before as well, there's like this subconscious bias to say, like, okay, well, you know, why, why did this happen? And I guess like just don't be too hard on yourself in, in those cases and really use it to your advantage. Because I, I do think that community is, is still small enough where you can reach out to other, other folks and they'll be helpful. You've done a lot of different experiences within your career. You started a company, you worked in, I guess, finance and banking, joined a large company as well, and then you're in venture now. Which one was your favorite? And people who are thinking about an operator role versus an investor role, what would you recommend? I mean, I think that that question is very personal to them and what they enjoy and what gets them up in the morning. And it's just different for different people. Like I, I highly recommend that 
people not start a company for the sake of starting a company, that like they really feel passionate about the the, the problem that they're trying to solve, that it's uh, something that they're, they're really kind of mentally prepared for. I feel like I've got a ton out of each of my different experiences and it's made me, I think, better at my current job as a as a VC, which I enjoy a ton and hopefully if, if, I, if I'm successful, we'll be doing this for a long time. But I think it's, again, like I just think it's different for, for different people and just understanding what's important to you. You see a lot of folks, and this is, this is not specific to any one group, but you see folks where they're not really honest with themselves. So they say, I really want to start a company, but they're currently, you know, working in a very high paid, high paid job. And it's like, okay, well, are you willing to give up that lifestyle to start a company? And they're like, yes, if I think I will be successful. But like on a risk adjusted basis, starting a company has like the lowest ROI. Like you're, it's very unlikely that you will make a ton of money, especially if you're already in a really, really relatively high paying job. And so just being honest about like, oh, well, you know, but I'm kind of bored. I don't, I don't really like this job. And so I think that like understanding what's really important to you like being honest about that, then from there you can kind of decide like what, what is it that is really important. What does it take to be an investor? What does it take to be an operator? What does it take to be an executive at a large company? Executive at a large company, being a strategic thinker and politically savvy and a good people manager is incredibly important, more than anything else, those three things. To be a good investor, I think, requires big picture macro thinking, very intellectual job. And then depending on the type of, since I've done both like, you know, asset management P and then also VC, it's, it's, it's also very different. VC is very network oriented, having a strong network, having a strong reputation. And then on the, on the PE side, it's like having the core kind of transactional finance skills is really important. The operator founder, I think the most important thing is number one, very strong sales skills. Like I think is, is incredibly important, especially if you're the CEO. And then number two, which is all related to number one, the ability to kind of convey a strong vision on why other people should join you. So whether that's for capital, whether that's helping helping your company from a partnership perspective, whether that's just joining your company, that's that's a like probably the most important skill. I'm not saying that like you have to go against your nature, but just recognize that if your end goal is to be an executive at a company, or your end goal is to be a successful entrepreneur, just recognize that those are the skills that you need to build over time. And if you don't have those skills, then you either need to convince other people to join you and compliment you in those skills, right? Because it's can't be good at every, most people aren't good at everything. Or you cultivate the right relationships so that they can help you get those skills that you need. Recently, I've heard a lot of interest in breaking into VC. Some of our listeners are interested in joining venture capital. Do you have any advice for them? Yeah, I, I, I think it's two things. One, which is more general advice, is there's no replacement for experience. So if you want to be a VC and you want to try to get into VC and you're not currently a VC, then doing the, the things that VCs do in terms of like thinking about new industries, building your own personal network for deal flow purposes, for biz dev, being helpful on special projects with VCs will be really helpful because that will show that you have the capacity to do it. And then the second, I think, is I like don't think about it from like a straight line, like, okay, I'm, I'm doing you know something that's not VC right now, and the next thing I want to do is VC. It often doesn't work that way. It might be that you do two other different things, whether that's starting a company, whether that's being an early employee at a really hot company that, that just blows up and does really well, and then moving into VC, right? So there's like a lot of different paths. We do have one question we want to ask you. What is your secret sauce? What makes you unique and um, what are some X factor that's gotten you to where you are right now? Yeah, when I think about what, what is it that's really made me successful, and I think the key thing is a you know a, a ability to really cultivate relationships up and down the chain. So ability to find folks that can really be your champions in any industry to, to, to really help you. And, and you'd be surprised at folks who've been you know, more successful than yourself, who have been uh, you know, more experienced, their willingness to help you. And then secondly, once you've gained some success, for me, like once I've gained some success, to really figure out ways to just be helpful and kind of give back because that in turn is, it just ends up being 
really helpful, particularly for like the industry that I'm in now. But I think that that's kind of general advice that's good for everyone. Thanks for listening to this week's episode with Kyle. We learned how Kyle went from being a founder, product manager, operator, and to finally doing what he loves in venture capital. And if you're a founder who's looking for investors, or if you want to break into VC, follow him on Twitter at Kyle Louie. If you like what you heard, follow us on Twitter at Fish Sauce Pod, or like us on Facebook at Fish Sauce Podcast for any upcoming episodes and latest updates. If this episode and the Fish Sauce mission resonates with you or others, please leave a review on our iTunes page. We love to welcome you and your friends into our Fish Sauce family. And lastly, big shout out to our awesome editor, Christian Edwards, for making us sound better than we actually are in each episode of Fish Sauce.